Good afternoon and welcome to EU Deal After Brexit show. I am Phoebe Rebo and I will be receiving this afternoon Constance Rua to talk about healthcare in the EU after Brexit. Hello Constance. Hello, thank you for, uh, for welcoming me. So today I'm going to be talking about the impact of Brexit on healthcare, as you just said. Um, so in which spheres more specifically did Brexit have an impact? Uh, so first of all, as uh, other people said, the transition period ended last January and the goal of this transition period was to negotiate a strong agreement in order to maintain the good relation between the UK and the EU and also to maintain the economic market that exists between both of the parties. So the problem with healthcare is that it encompasses several spheres and this time it mainly affected the market authorization procedures, healthcare insurance and social security, pharmacovigilance and the recognition of professional qualifications in healthcare. Okay, so what exactly is co-vigilance? So pharmacovigilance is the practice of monitoring the effects of medical drugs after they have been licensed, so released on the market. And uh, the goal of the pharmacovigilance is to evaluate the potential negative effects of, uh, of the drugs that just have been released. So in, the, in those times of pandemic, it's pretty useful because right now they are um, controlling the vaccines such as uh, AstraZeneca and okay. we saw in, uh, in the news a few days ago that um, they, the EMA, the European Medical Agency, stopped uh, the, the marketing of the vaccine to then put it back on it a few days later on. Okay. So we really see its active role and its importance but the problem is that with, with the Brexit, the UK is no longer part of the European Medical Agency, so it means that Brexit, um, that the UK have, have no access anymore to the database and is not able to participate nor advise and um, make decision in the EMA, which is a pretty good change, pretty um, big change. Yeah, a drastic change for them, yeah. Yeah, it's a great, uh, great change because it was an active participant in the European Medical Agency. Okay, but um, so healthcare mainly concerns patients. So what exactly did Brexit change for the patients? So patients could be affected in various ways, and the first one being the shortage of medicine. So uh, to avoid this problem, the United Kingdom refers itself to the human, human Medicine Regulation of 2012, which sets out a list of approved countries for the importa importation of medicine, but also for the wholesale license and for the batch testing of medicines. And they laid down uh, in, regulation, in the regulation 450 that it will require from the exporting country of the active substance, uh, which is what makes the medicine work actually, a written, a written confirmation of good manufacturing practices okay. that is equivalent to those that are, um, that are actually enforced in the UK. Okay. Uh, another sphere that could affect the patients is the recognition of professional qualification in healthcare, even though directly it affects more doctors than patients, but if there is no pending, uh, no pending dip diploma of friends to UK or, or the reverse, it will affect patients anyway. So therefore, in the trade cooperation, uh, trade cooperation agreement that uh, was released at the end of this transition period, in Article 7, uh, 5.13, Paragraph 2, it sets out and regulates a procedure to effectively recognize the qualification of the other party. Okay. Otherwise, it will, uh, without this procedure, it will cause big problems with cross-border cross workers. And I'm thinking particularly of Ireland and, and the United Kingdom. Yeah, Ireland is a big problem uh, in Brexit. Okay, and you mentioned previously uh, healthcare insurance and social security. So what are the highest chances due to Brexit um, in, in this field? What are, what are going to be the main changes? Uh, actually, there was, there, were, there was a will of maintaining uh, the equivalence of the social, social security standards that were here when the UK was still part of the Union. So there's a protocol of social security coordination that is adopting the provision of, of two regulation of 2009 and 2004 that are already applied in the EU. And um, it is uh, accepted that the UK still applies EU law as if it was still part of it okay. in order to ease the procedures. So the social security in the UK covers the field of death grant and validity benefit, maternity, sickness benefit, and many others that are listed in Article SSC3 of the ETCA agreement, which is not covered, however, 
is long-term care patients for new cases. Um, indeed, if there is no cross-border relation between the patient and the, for example, the French patient and the, United, uh, and the English hospital, if they need long-term care treatment, it will no longer be possible if this relation did not pre-exist uh, before 2021. So uh, the, stake, the stake of this social security to maintain it at the same level of the EU is to allow the greatest number to benefit of health insurance and also to save economic interest of both the EU and the UK. Okay. And lastly, the thing that I will add is that it is still possible to use the European Health Insurance Card and the Provisional Replacement Certificate, which is... It's a great advantage for EU citizens and yeah, UK citizens. Of course, because we saw also that there is a lot of French citizens that are uh, actually in London, in the UK, and this is important for them to have a certainty when regarding to the health. Okay, thank you, Constance, for uh, answering my questions, and thank you for listening to the EU deal after Brexit show. Goodbye.